In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Heavenly Father, may your goodness and love be present amongst us today. Come, bless our gathering with unity, hope, and vision. Build in us all a deep respect for one another, for the manifold challenges and burden we live with. Let us feel communion. Lord, we pray for hope. Come, fill your hope within our hearts and renew our faith. Lord, we pray for vision. May your vision fill our lives and let us feel your love and guidance. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Italy is one of the European countries which has been affected the most by the pandemic and it was also one of the first. From the end of February of last year, the infection has caused more than 90,000 deaths and has damaged the economy and society of the country in ways that are difficult to record and will continue to affect us for the years to come. The closure of schools in February 2020 has had a notable effect on children's education, above all in the most needy in society. Not every child has been able to follow the online lessons because having only one computer, there are other family members who need it, like parents working from home. The deep recession that has hit the tourist industry, such a vital part of the Italian economy, has created and will continue to create an employment and social conflict. Up until now, the government's decision to prohibit redundancies has calmed the situation, but the fear is that this will end in the spring or summer. If to this we add that the economic crisis is favoring the rise in the polls of nationalistic and anti-European parties, we are extremely worried about the long-term consequences to the democracy of our country. As a little reformed church, we have had to deal with long periods of closure and even now, our churches can only accommodate a, redu a reduced number of at services. If you consider that many of our churches have small rooms, there are some churches that have not yet been able to restart proper church life. Also, in the churches which have started having Sunday services again, the reduced number of seats has meant that for a year we have not to been able to celebrate any baptism, confirmations and weddings. Funerals have often to be held outside. Church activities like choirs and youth group have not been able to meet. We have responded with online catechism classes, Sunday school services, Bible studies and meetings using social media 
But in the long term, a church without personal contact risks sustaining damage to the makeup of its congregation, both in human and community terms. For the first time since the Second World War, we have had neither regional nor a national synod. The economic consequences we are also beginning to, ver to very seriously be felt. However, we do not want this to distract from us from our commitment to support the less fortunate. We cannot forget the many homeless people who are growing in number in our cities and those who have lost or at risk of losing work. Besides beside this, we are continuing our commitment to the migrants who are arriving from the North African coast. At the moment, the main debate in our country is about the vaccines. The politicians see it merely in nationalistic or at most in European terms. We need to note that the only voices that are raised in our country in favor of the vaccine distributed free throughout the world, these only voices come from the Catholic, Protestant and Orthodox churches. continue listening to various regions and network groups. We continue to be overwhelmed by the responsibility that was given to the disciples and by extension to the church by Jesus Christ when he said, you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world. I wonder if Jesus Christ knew about COVID-19. How are we to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in COVID-19 times and beyond? But I believe that when we work together, our saltiness will be felt throughout the earth and our light will so shine before all people that they will see our works and as they see our works they'll glorify God in heaven. So you're welcome to this discernment circle as we'll be listening today to Europe as the region and to the RAN which is a network on racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism. We are building up towards the conference that will be in September this year. And I am sure those that have started the journey with us will agree that we are gaining traction in each and every one of these sessions. And the momentum that we've just built, we need to maintain and even increase. So that as we go to the conference in September, 2021, we're able to be this salt of the earth and the light of the world, of course, guided 
by our theme, what does the, what does the Lord require of you? So we've got to respond to that big question. I will now invite those who have been assigned to carry on with the work as we move on to Europe. Our brother Hans will come in after the presentations to tell us about how we are going to go to the discernment uh, or discussion groups or breakout groups, whichever way you want to put it. Then we'll move on to the network on racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism. I now hand over to Europe. The COVID pandemic is a fast and profound crisis for the whole world. It not only reveals the weak points of individual societies, but it is also fundamentally questions the structures of our coexistence on this earth. As if under a magnifying glass, it becomes clear that the crisis intensifies existing injustices. If a whole part of our communion is excluded from the vaccinations, we are called to raise our voices, to think and to act. This is what the pandemic reveals. But we are facing other issues as well. What answers does the church have when people ask for communion and worship, but are not allowed to meet? As Christians, what can we say to the elderly who are left alone? What to those who are left alone in their illness? What consolation do we have for relatives when they are no longer allowed to visit their dying parents? What can we give children and adolescents who cannot meet their friends and whose lives in times of pandemic are not normal for the life of children and adolescents? For many churches in Europe, the question arises whether and how they are systemically relevant. This is interpreted very different by the differing politics in the countries of Europe. In Germany, churches can continue to worship under strict conditions, while cultural events are prohibited. In Sweden, on the other hand, shops were sometimes open and churches were closed at the same time or only eight people were allowed to come. The COVID crisis is also a crisis for the church. To take on an appropriate role under these conditions, to comfort the people and to deliver the good news to them, although the elixir of life of the church, the sense of communion and fellowship is not available, is a great challenge at the moment. We also see really with really great concern that in some European countries, the nationalist, authoritarian and xenophobic movements have grown strong and we are observing increasing anti-Semitism and violence also by groups that the philosopher Hannah Arendt called mob. These developments are fueled by conspiracy theories that deny the pandemic. Against this background, democratic structures are often fundamentally questioned and declared to be weak. And every political measure which is intended to protect against infection and thereby means and must mean a restriction of fundamental rights is seen as evidence of this. We share with many people in the world that many people in Europe are facing economic hardship as a result of the pandemic and that economic security is no longer a given for men. Here, too, those most affected are those who were previously precariously employed, often women in the low wage sector, for example, in the catering industry or small business owners. 
In some countries, leaders are using the COVID pandemic and the conditions of limited contact to violently create political facts. In Belarus, for example, the brutal suppression of demonstrations against electoral fraud in Hungary and other European countries as well to imprison refugees. For some minorities, for example, the Roma in Eastern Europe, the consequences of the pandemic are a matter of life and death. And not only if they are sick, because Church's aid projects cannot longer be maintained and there are no public help for them. In the last few months, we saw hospitals in some countries not able or willing to help people because medical personnel is infected themselves or patients have not enough money to corrupt them. In these times, it is important to stand together as community. We long to be perceived as part of the world communion and to be accompanied in prayer and intercession. We are very grateful that we are allowed to report on our challenges, that our worries are considered in prayer and can be shared before God. He has told you, mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's the words of the prophet Micah. Following Christ means taking certain steps. The first step, which responds to the call, separates the followers from the previous existence. A call to discipleship thus immediately creates a new situation. Staying in the old situation and following Christ mutually exclude each other. At first, that was quite visible the case. The point was to really walk with Jesus. It was made clear to those he called that they only had one possibility of believing in Jesus, that of leaving everything and going with the incarnate Son of God. These are the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Following Christ means taking certain steps for the truth and justice of the incarnated Son, even if those steps lead you into the Nazi prison at Tegel in order to be executed by means of hanging on April 9, 1945, as was the case with Bonhoeffer merely two weeks before the end of World War II. The COVID-19 pandemic stormed our planet in unforeseen ways and changed profoundly our well-established expectations of eternal political and economic progress and of the scientific advantages of the new superhuman sapiens sapiens species who believes the self to be in control of its present and future as well. Dr. Noah Harari gives a very provoking description of these new, almost self-improved homo sapiens as being at the verge of becoming a god, a homo deus, ready not only to achieve eternal youth, but also acquiring the divine abilities of creation and catastrophe. A homo deus, a mere man-god of whom certain individuals, along with certain mega companies, digital consumer industry, social media, information technology, to mention a few, and even governments for the last year of COVID intrusion are taking advantage of the primal and deepest fears and insecurities of our humanity in an effort to secure more power and more profit, whilst controlling our freedoms and redefining what is truth, justice, love. Truth is redefined by what our information technology chooses to feed us. Justice is redefined by the perception of social media. And love is redefined by consumerism, social media, and information combined. The antithesis is like a homo. Behold the man, the thorn crowned Jesus Christ. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Prophet Isaiah proclaims. Today, what does it look like to walk humbly with God? What steps do we take and where do these steps lead those of his church who love guidance and do justice according to the gospel of Jesus Christ? In the midst of the storm, we're living engulfed in a state of empty, dull, often strange curfew days. Ms. Amanda Gorman, the youngest inaugural poet in U.S. history, brings her fresh language and speaks to us regarding 
the hill we climbed. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we will forever be tied together victorious. As koinonia of the Global Reformed Church, we should hear carefully and delightfully such words, especially as we believe that the church as divine agent is always reformed and informing ethos in person and society. Our walk with God lands our step on a higher ground, standing tall for true information and practical solidarity for the oppressed, the neglected, the victims of all sorts. Christian orthopraxy is not a mere spiritual philanthropy. It's an advocacy of and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be advocates for a higher character ethos, opposing all oppression, perjury, and bribery, welcoming grace in the light of truth and justice. In the old days, Micah, the prophet calls for a partnership with God, and he described as walking with him. It's not a walk of comfort, of easy money giving, publishing of political statements, or solidarity prayers. In the biblical words, does Yahweh appreciate burnt offerings or sacrifice as much as obeying Yahweh's voice? No, better is obedience than sacrifice and submissiveness than ram's fat. Often the religious side of the Christian faith is conveniently blindsiding us of God sovereignly over the whole life. Ceremonies discharged with emotional feeling and material extravagance become the sum total of spiritual commitment. The post-COVID-19 era brings a challenge for the church to genuinely work alongside with God, leaving out afresh the ethos of Jesus Christ who claims, I am the way, the truth, and life. Dr. Nicholas Christakis, a Yale professor and social epidemiologist whose expertise is in how our behaviors influence contagion in society, says, we are the first generation of humans alive who has ever faced this threat that allows them to respond in real time with efficacious medicines. During epidemics, we get increases in religiosity. People become more abstentious. They save money, they get risk averse. And we are seeing all of that now, just as we have for hundreds of years during epidemics. In 2024, all of those pandemic trends will be reversed. People will endlessly seek out social interactions. That could include sexual licensedness, liberal spending, and reverse religiosity. Christakis continues, as a society, we have been very mature immature and typical as well. We could have done better. Our world has changed. There is a new deadly pathogen that is circulating. We are not the first people that have had to face this threat and a lot will be asked of us. And we're just going to have to be grown up about it. And the people of God say, be very careful then how you live not as unwise, but as wise. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Ephesians 5.15 Our call as disciples of Christ immediately creates a new situation. Staying in the old situation, following the ethos of what we call homo deus, and following Christ mutually exclude each other. As Dr. Noah Harari states about this homo deus, the new ethos promises paradise with the prerequisite that the rich will continue to be greedy and spend their time making money, while the masses will allow their desires and passions to run freely, buying more and more. This is the first religion in history where its fans do exactly what is asked of them. How do we truly know that in return we will gain paradise? We have seen it on TV. The opportunity of doing things better, thus not be foolish and understand what the Lord's will is for the post-COVID-19 era should lead us, Christ followers, to leave behind our old situation and at his church embrace existence anew. We, Christ followers, are called to govern in truth and integrity his household, the church. We are asked to lead by paradigm by sacrificing our comfort and empathizing with the wounded and misplaced, not only with those we relate to, but to humanity as a whole. Christ's followers are sent to shape a fresh language, 
and in new ways to communicate the revolutionary love ethos of the triune God and bring his truth, justice, and love to all. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's words, the tax collector had to leave his booth and Peter his nets to follow Jesus. According to our understanding, even back then, things could have been quite different. Jesus could have given tax collector new knowledge of God and left him in his old situation. If Jesus had not been God's son, become human, then that would have been possible. But because Jesus is the Christ, it has to be made clear from the beginning that his word is not a doctrine. Instead, it creates existence anew. The point was to really walk with Jesus. It was made clear to those he called that they only had one possibility of believing in Jesus, that of living everything and going with the incarnate Son of God. Thank you. The COVID-19 crisis has not only been hard on the world and on the societies that we as churches live in. Being part of humanity, societies and the world, the pandemic has also struck us as churches hard. Some of our very foundations, such as communion, koinonia, have been challenged by the distance we have been forced to keep. But Will the experiences we have made in 20 and 21 only leave ugly scars on the body of Christ? Or are there also lessons to be learned that have made us humbler and experiences that will make us stronger? Many of the learnings we make are about rediscovering the resources of our Christian faith and of our church. And let me mention some. What I share, of course, comes from my context, which is Europe. The most important thing to learn and relearn is the power in listening to stories of other contexts. Especially coming from a privileged place, this feels more important than to tell. But these are my reflections. One, to use our voice. When studying different crises, you can see that most of them have one thing in common. They disclose both obvious and more hidden truths about society. What is revealed is often ugly truths of injustices at the very root of how our societies are organized. A crisis is like a mirror that shows us the true self of our societies. Also COVID-19 has shown us that where inequality as is high and resources scarce, the crisis strikes harder. We see this in every local society in Europe and even more if we look at the effects of the pandemic globally. COVID-19 has once again reminded us as churches in wealthy countries of the importance to speak up for compassion and for justice. There is a constant but now even more obvious need for churches to raise our voices against global injustices. We need always to put pressure on and challenge our own governments to go further, to take responsibility also for people in other ends of the world. Two, act to stop climate changes. There are lots of questions to raise when it comes to what measures are relevant to stop the spread of the infection. And it is in many aspects relevant to criticize authorities for the way coordination between countries, companies and organizations have been led. There are many risks with hasty and extensive actions and the ones now taken are far from being equal, but still. Can the extensive actions that have been taken to fight the virus be used as an example that it is possible to act drastically when needed? Could this be an example for the leaders of the world to realize that it is actually possible to act resolutely to slow down the climate changes? We have now seen that if only we realize the urgency, extensive actions can be taken without having to negotiate for years until it is too late. Three, to meet digitally. It is painful not to be able to meet in our churches. The gospel can only be made visible when shared also physically. 
Jesus showed this himself many times by sharing bread, lightening a fire, placing a hand on a wounded body, by walking by the side, by washing feet. But being a church in diaspora, not being able to meet physically, does not mean that the church disappears. In the hope of soon meeting again, many of us have learned to, a lot about how to meet digitally. What we have learned will be helpful also after the pandemic stops us from meeting. We have seen people come to our digital church rooms, people that would never have dared to enter our buildings. We as a church have practiced to open up our internal groups. Some churches can tell that they have celebrated worship services with far higher attendance numbers than would have been the case had they met as usual in church. People that would not have had time to come to a physical meeting can attend a digital one, given the circumstance that they can join for a while from their home. People that cannot afford the travels can still attend a digital meeting elsewhere in the world. The ones who are too ill to leave their home or have to stay home to keep watch over their kids can still attend a digital prayer group. The importance of small groups. In some countries, we've been allowed to meet in church, but only with a very limited number of people. This has been an eye opener for the importance of small groups. Less is sometimes more. A crowded building is not the only possible sign for a thriving church community. We have been reminded that small gatherings where life and prayers are shared with one another before God is a gift to the Christian life and essential to the church. Diakony is crucial. Among the most painful experiences for local churches has been to be, not to be able to care for people in the ways we are used to. How can we find and reach out to lonely people when we have, when we have to stay home? How can we help the homeless when we may not open up our shelters? How can we support one another in our struggle with mental illness when we cannot see and touch? We have seen that there are many creative ideas to find new ways for caring and curing. But my hope is also that more people have more deeply understood how important and meaningful our diaconal life as Christians is. Support young people. Children and young people have paid a high price in times of social distancing. During their formatting years, when it is important to meet friends and other adults, they have been forced to stay home. For some of those, the home is not a good place to be locked into. As grown-ups, we need to show the young people respect for the sacrifices they have made to stop the spread of the infection. One way of showing them respect is now to take the challenges of the climate change serious so that we leave them with a world possible to live in. To be filled with wonder. The loss of opportunities to meet have reminded us to be thankful for things we too easily take for granted. The communion, the koinonia of the church is essential. Yes, it is life-changing. The pandemic situation challenges us and reminds us to explore it deeper Invite to it more often, it. live by it, be thankful for it. Thank you so much to the speakers. Friends, having listened to Martina, Dimitris and Jenny, we want to go back to the worship mode as we take the remainder of the worship, worship team. And we will start with the Eastern European flashlight from Judith. Afterwards, prayer and music. And according to our records, Judith will be live.
everybody. Hello, you did. Uh, shall I take the word? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm from Romania. COVID-19 and beyond. In December uh, 2019, we were watching in Eastern Europe the news coming from very distant places about a growing disease. It happened far from us. We thought it was in safe distance. It would not affect us. In March 2020, the new disease was devastating in Italy and it was flooding Europe from south to north, from east to west. It reached us too. We got into a hard global crisis that we have not seen in generations. We lost our former lives overnight as our grandparents and parents lost theirs in the Second World War and during communism. It was fast and unexpected and we did not know what to do and how to react. There was no living collective wisdom on how to cope with killing viruses and radical changes. We only knew that God gave us free will to serve his kingdom. In critical moments, we need to make decisions in the Holy Spirit. We need to decide between our coming or surrendering to a global crisis. Europe is having many challenges, including identity quest, and has been learning to act in unity amid diversity. Romania is the poorest country of the European Union, and medical care is one of its weakest points. Changes to fight the virus were very little in Romania. However, after some weeks of shock and fear, we return to the roots of European civilization, the word of God. We have discovered contemporary ways to spread, to spread his word. That is the highest human reality on earth. Days with two feet on the ground, it feels, sees and hears and helps our community with both hands. We redesigned modern channels of communication and transformed them to serve God and his people. Sermons were preached online. Social media became a blessed tool for outreach. Besides free will, creativity is also a gift from God. We have encouraged each other. And digital sermons also came to similarly to pulpit preaching. For over a year, we have been experiencing God's love and mercy in a huge global crisis. Financially, East Europe, especially Romania, was hit very hard. People do not have savings and reserves, losing jobs was an instant threat for survival. This is the heritage of atheist communist dictatorship. The mo most important income source for the Romanian people, season work in Western Europe was also terminated because of lockdowns. Millions of people returned to Romania without ch chances to support their families decently. The global crisis has different local faces in Romania. Power is one of them. Personal and social depression is another. As we turn to our neighbors in Romania to help our two million people, God showed us again that there are always people of you who are facing even more difficult challenges than your suffering community. But their souls are in his mercy too. State structures failed to overcome this crisis. The European Union was not such crisis management either. We, reformed Christians, adapted to the new situation somehow. Internet and telephone lines became God's tools for outreach. God's word became bread 
water, and comfort. We were able to feed hungry children and elderly people. Lonely people received spiritual comfort from our pastors and volunteers. Some people had money to share with our community, but the majority of us donated energy and time, love and care. Solidarity is stronger than before the crisis. Our churches were given a blessed opportunity to reintroduce God and his love to our secularizing societies. People may recognize God through love, help, comfort that goes out from our congregations. May God help us be able to answer his call to leave his people out of this global crisis. Thank you. Christ, light of the whole world. In the time of Lent, when you walk the tough road to Jerusalem with us, we pray. Stay with the sick ones. Comfort those who grieve their loved ones. Support those who have lost jobs and incomes. Give strength to medical workers. Come with wisdom to those with power to make decisions. Give them courage to fight for justice. As Europeans, we pray for our sisters and brothers all over the world, especially for those suffering from the effects of injustice, for those whose needs have not yet been seen and met. Holy Spirit, touch us all today so that we can see clearer what the calling to communion and the commitment to justice mean in our present situation. God, our creator, we pray with Isaiah. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Amen. May God who creates and carries, loves and struggles, Amen. use and gives life, comfort us and challenge us, Bless us and give us peace. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Brother Hans, please advise us how we're going to go to the breakout groups, what we're going to do there. Yes, thank you, Lungile. And I think we go in uh, the uh, spirit of this blessing into our process of discernment. 
the European uh, group has given us three questions to ponder. And I asked Nathan to put the slide into the center that we all see. And um, they ask us to engage with the three major uh, contributions that we have heard. Number one, the one of Martina. The question is, can we as churches claim that we are systemically relevant for our societies, that we are as important as hospitals and pharmacies? Second, Dimitris uh, referred to Mika's words to walk humbly with God and says, it is not a walk of comfort, of easy money giving, publishing of political statements and solidarity prayers. The post-COVID-19 era brings the challenge to generally walk alongside with God. How to do, how and to where do you think we as Christians will need to walk in the post-COVID era. And with regard to Jenny's input, do you see any possible learnings we as church can do in times of the pandemic? While we were listening, we have collected all the names of those presents. We hope sincerely that we haven't forgot anyone and you will all go into the um, breakout groups we have appointed a moderator and a scribe for every group. And we encourage us on the streams on Facebook and YouTube. Please use the chat functions in both. We will read carefully what you're writing and we will introduce it into our deliberations. We have 20 minutes and we will, uh, I wish you all a very, very good conversation. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm sure we are all back. Wow, what a session it was. We, we needed an hour for this session. I'm sure other groups agree with me. We, we needed an hour. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I disagree. We needed so much more than that. <laughs> I'm sure, four yes. questions. Wow, four You're questions. Right. You, you are right, Chris. You, there's too much to be said on those three questions. I'm telling you, but I hope the little that we said will go far uh, mm -hmm. to be that season uh, on the earth, the salt and the light. Um, we need to move on to the next session where I will hand over now to the panel that will be taking us through uh, that discussion on racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism. Over to you, friends. Uh, friends, dearly beloved in Christ, welcome to the second hour of this sharing circle, where the program on racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism will actually be presenting a panel to you, a panel discussion. The moderator that we have for this discussion is the Reverend Dr. Peniel Rajkumar, who is a Dalit theologian from India. Peniel presently works with the World Council of Churches as a program coordinator of interreligious dialogue and cooperation. A public theologian, he is the author of several books and articles on a wide variety of subjects. And he will be moderating the four following panelists. The first is Dr. Tandi Soka de Jong, who is a Malawian Dutch PhD student currently studying intercultural theology at the Protestant Theological University in Groningen. She has a background in African studies, theology and development, and biblical studies and mass communication from Leiden University's African Studies Center, the University of KwaZulu Natal, and African Bible College, Malawi. Our second panelist is the Reverend Shania D. Leonard. They are the National Co uh, Associate for Gender and Racial Justice for the Presbyterian Church USA. An ordained minister for over 13 years, Shania considers themselves a 21st century abol abolitionist called to the work of liberation for the most marginalized. 
Our third panelist is the Reverend Dr. Joseph Prabhakar Dayam, a professor of theology at the Andhra Christian Theological College, Hyderabad in India. He is also the of the collective of Dalit ecumenical Christian scholars, also known as Codex. And our final panelist is the Dr. Simone Dos Anjos, and she is a social scientist graduated from the Federal University of Sao Paulo. She has a master's in education from the University of Sao Paulo and a PhD in anthropology from USP. She is a member of Evangelicals for Gender Equality of the Network of Black Evangelical Women and a member of the Independent Presbyterian Church of Brazil. Let me take this opportunity to welcome our moderator and the panelists. I offer two instructions. On the top right corner, you will see a series of nine dots with the word view written on them. If you click this, you can change it to speaker mode and then you will see only those who are speaking. The Second instruction that I will offer is that if you have a question, you can type the question in the chat box. And if the moderator discerns this as being an important question, we'll direct it to one of the panelists. Over to you, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, thank you to my dear brother, Philip uh, Peacock. Um, brothers and sisters, um, we live in a world where there is a growing overt and often violent upsurge of racist ideologies that are more often than not fed by nationalist discourses. If I have to put it differently, nationalisms today are no longer solely about geopolitical landscapes. They are also about landscapes of the mind, so to speak, whose borders are being drawn and redrawn with hostility and fear to suit vested political agendas. In such a context where our politicians see the fear of the other as being almost the magical silver bullet, which can enhance the political fortunes, right-wing forces that are fueled by racist and quasi-fascist ideologies have asserted themselves in political life as well as in policy in many parts of our world. For example, in India, nationalist ideologies undergirded by militant religiosity found center stage. And what this has meant is a particular backlash in the forms of state perpetrated as well as mob initiated violence, including lynching on ethnic and religious minorities. And along with this, and obviously related, there are authoritarian forms of government em emerging around the world. So what we will try to do through this sharing circle will be to lift up the voices of racialized communities around the world, while at the same time enfleshing or fleshing out the connections between racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism. As the late James Baldwin once said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Yes, nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this sharing circle is an attempt to face the sins that we need to overcome, the sins of racism, casteism, authoritarianism, and nationalism, those viruses which have preceded and will in all probability outlive the coronavirus. And to help us to think through this, I'm going to start off with a general question to our panelists. 
we will have a round of uh, uh, questions and then we will try and see how we navigate this together. So let me start with uh, Tandi. As you, uh, Tandi, as you, agree, uh, as you engage with the question of racisms, authoritarian and authoritarianisms and nationalisms, what are some of the most important issues for your own agenda of justice? Thank you for the question. Um, as I as was introduced, I am a Malawian Dutch person, so that means that I, I'm living in the in the context of the Netherlands, and therefore the my response to your question, I'll give it as an African in diaspora. Um, so for me, an important issue is that uh, in the environment where I live, no one admits uh, to being racist or to doing racist things. And yet people express that they experience uh, racism. So I think for me, one of the key issues is to, uh, to continue to educate people about what racism is and um, both at the systemic level, but also at the individual level, its history, but also um, in the education system that we have to um, bring to the table the discussion that in, formal, in the formal education system, the content as well as the, the representation is not as it, as it should be. Um, and what I mean by that is that oftentimes you will find that the content of um, our education system, it limits the contribution of uh, minority groups. But at the same time, you also find that as you go higher up uh, the ladder of education, you find less and less diversity. So for me, that's, that is one of the, the, the critical issues, um, educating generally, but also uh, interrogating the content of the education system. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, shall I um, ask uh, Shania to address the same question? What do you think are the most pressing issues for you? Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, thank you for the question. And so um, similar to what Tandy has said, we have a lot of issues of systemic racism and various forms uh, within our country that have have lingered for as long as the inception of the United States. And so these are not new problems. However, what is prevalent right now and on the forefront of the issues of racism, authoritarianism and nationalism is the rise and the, um, the overt racism that has happened, which has been fueled by our, our last administration. And as you all have seen, um, even resulted in an attack on um, our country's capital building. Uh, just last month, and that there, that seems as if the racist um, ideology of half of our country is becoming more and more prevalent to the point where it has made many areas very unsafe. And um, the rise and just the, the need to be outwardly racist has resulted in a lot of division. And what is also troubling is how that rise and in um, overt racism and white nationalism is connected to the church and the very conservative wing of Christianity and what that poses for and what that says about the nature of the church and how we connect to the sin and the evil of racism. And then finally, an issue that is very prevalent is what is something that has is connected to systemic racism and that's the issue of police brutality. And if you don't know the history of even policing in this country, comes from slave catchers and um, folks who hunted slaves. And so it seems some often sometimes that that has that 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 uh, vein of racism has continued in some of the practices policies that have uh, attributed to the deaths of many black folks and people of color in this country at the hands of law enforcement. And so I would say those are the prevalent issues that face us in the United States. Thank you very much, uh, Shania. Now, now I'm going to turn to our third panelist, um, Joseph from India, and ask him what are the issues that stand out for him from the Indian context? Joseph. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, the, thanks for having me. 
in this uh, conversation. Um, as I look at India today, perhaps my mind oscillates between despair and hope. Uh, despair because uh, over the last couple of weeks we have seen uh, a 21 year old young girl was arrested on charges of sedition for editing two sentences in a document called Turkit that was initiated by Greta Thunberg, the environment, uh, environmental activist. And also, uh, I am aware of the way in which the human rights are being uh, denied and how the human rights activists are being witch hunted and put behind bars. We are aware of 83-year-old uh, father who worked for the rights of the indigenous people uh, who is behind the bars now uh, for his activism. We also are aware of uh, an 80-year-old poet by name Barbar Rao who has been in the jail for the last two and a half years and finally uh, got his bail this week. And also Disha uh, got, her, uh, got her bail. Uh, the kind of context in which we are placed is a context where all the estates of democracy, whether it is judiciary, whether it is executive, or whether it is uh, media, uh, all of them somehow bowing themselves before the authoritarian regimes and becoming a uh, propaganda machinery for the, uh, for the rise of religious nationalism uh, in the state. So that is one of the uh, major concerns uh, that I find uh, in the country. And also in the, in the, in the process, uh, pushing on this diverse nation with plurality of uh, religious traditions, uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, a unitary narrative, uh, which somehow assumes unity, which actually is not there. Uh, and anyone uh, who in any way articulates a human right discourse uh, is being labeled as anti-national or as somebody who is bringing division in the country. I think there's something that we are actually facing uh, in our own times. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, I'm going to turn to Simone and um, ask you what are the things that uh, stand out for you um, when, when we think of racism, authoritarianism, and um, nationalism. Thank you for the question. So uh, here in Brazil, we have a president who rules to death. We have a government that has not invested in prevention and that did not invest in the purchase of uh, inputs for vaccines after the development of the vaccine. And that did not guarantee that vaccine will be distributed universally in Brazil. Establishing priorities precisely because of lack of vaccine. And today, not even the elderly who would be priority have been vaccinated. The misery in Brazil, since 2016, after the coup against President Dilma Rousseff, the number of miserable people in Brazil has increased. We have uh, we have had governments that not invest in social public politics. So, in context of COVID-19, um, the absence of public basic income politics for people in this context of a pandemic has caused domestic workers and informal workers were the most affected. In, the, in that context, the racism is uh, clearly present in our context in COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic coupled with the lack of the support from the Jair Bolsonaro government for the most vulnerable is accelerating the growth of poverty in Brazil and already places the country as an emerging epicenter of the extreme hunger, according to the report released today by the NGO Oxfam. Brazil is a country 
that does not carry out any indentured process for the enslaved people who were released. This caused a huge difference between black people and other people in Brazil. Black people since then have always been the poorest in Brazil. The pandemic only evidenced this. So, here, the first die for, uh, because COVID-19 was a black Roman poor, she worked as a maid to able to eat. She was 63. She was a hard worker. She took three drives to get to work, to return. It was the same thing, two buses and a train. She left the home uh, sorry, she left the home on Sunday and only returned on Thursday. So, here in Brazil, the black people is dying a lot. The majority of victims from COVID-19 is black people. Black people is also more likely to be infected and are the greater risk of hospitalization. Racism, social social inequalities, unequal access to health system, inadequate housing and inability to isolate make the most vulnerable population the most affected by the pandemic. So here in Brazil, we, ha we have a government who rules to death, the authorities and fundamentalism. We have a lot of churches who is run together the President Jair Bolsonaro. We have a lot of uh, priests and uh, Christian people who don't understand what is happening with the black people in Brazil. We have to denun denunciate it here. We have to denunciate it in Brazil. You have to denunciate here in Brazil. Christian people are not to run to life, unfortunately. We have to understand we have to uh, have public politics to life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, um, I think that was uh, what, what the four of you have helped provide is a broad canvas of the way in which uh, racism, uh, authoritarianism, and uh, nationalism intersect with many other injustices. Um, uh, to just uh, reinforce a world which is terribly unequal. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to each of the panelists and ask you each a specific question. Um, Tandi, you started off with the question of um, uh, education um, and how education is important. Uh, I want you to um, help us theologically frame these issues um, using education as being a tool through which churches can become much more aware and much more empowered to tackle these sins of racism, authoritarianism, and nationalism. Thank you for that question. Um, I hope you don't mind that I will go behind that question. Because for Please me, don't. when I oh, think, when I look at it, I think of how um, when knowledge is produced, including theological knowledge, there are a lot of assumptions that we have. So for me as an African, when I, I came and I, I was part of the culture, I assumed that there were certain theological concepts that, that meant the same thing to everybody. But when you don't interrogate those concepts, you don't know that other people uh, understand them differently. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the, concept, the concept of Imago Dei, for example, is something that everyone assumes means the image of God. But then if you, if, you, if you critically look at how knowledge within a context is produced, you will understand that for some people, when they think of the image of God, they think of a particular kind of human being and not all others. And so I think the task for churches and theologians to always know and always be very critical about what is meant. And when you find that there are problems in, in what uh, different groups of people mean when they're using concepts like this, then you can interrogate those. So um, just to give you a short story of what happened to me, I was having a conversation with a fellow academic and he is no you know, theologian and very well experienced. And we reached a point when we were, were talking about race and racism. And my colleague did not agree with what I was saying. And because he did not agree, 
um, it came out in the conversation, this realization that he did not think that I had what it takes to speak <laughs> to, 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 to him about these issues. And when I went further into it, I realized that the, he could not understand what I was saying because I did not fit into what an image of God is. I was a woman and I was black, etc. So I, I think one of the important tasks is, is to interrogate how we produce our knowledge and also to talk about certain themes that we think are universal and unpack those and uh, try to solve <laughs> the gaps in there. I hope that answers. Uh, Thank you. Thank know. you very much. Um... Sandy, it does. Uh, I'm now going to turn to uh, you, Shania, um, and then um, thinking about uh, uh, um, taking Tandy's uh, reflections forward about how um, our responses to all these injustices can be, can be um, informed by various sources. I want to uh, draw, the, uh, um, draw the focus uh, into the Black Lives Matter movement. And I want you to help us to understand whether there is anything uh, from the other black liberation movements that have helped and that have informed uh, the praxis of the Black Lives Matter, um, uh, Matter movement. Absolutely. Um, so the Black Lives Matter movement is a movement that is grassroots informed. It starts uh, around 2014 with the murder of Trayvon Martin and Sanford, Florida, and grows really with the murder of Michael Brown and St. Louis, Missouri, um, both at the hands of some racist practices undergirding those who killed them. And so this movement starts as not as a system with one person in charge, but it starts as a system of um, really um, this, this understanding that your life as a black person matters and it has substance and it has purpose and it, it's something to be treasured, to be honored and to celebrate it. That understanding comes directly from uh, the movements that happened in the 1970s around the black power movement and black liberation movement and traces of that still exist within the Black Lives Matter movement. Furthermore, this understanding of the need to critique our justice system and our government system that comes out of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s is very much still a thread and a strand within Black Lives Matter movement. However, where they defer is the need for um, a more aggressive approach at looking at how we um, produce change and how change is made. And so it's not necessarily a monolithic movement, but it's a movement that is um, concentrated from a variety of sources that is also not um, housed firmly in the faith community either. And that's um, intentional, but it's housed in this understanding that your life either as a black person of faith or not, as a queer person of um, a black person or not, as a black person of um, financial substance or not, whatever your particular um, position in life, your life still has meaning and substance and value and must be um, affirmed as so in all our systems within our country. Thank you very much. Um, uh, from the question of race, I think probably we, uh, we will move to the question of caste and I want to draw uh, Joseph into the conversation. And, um, uh, and uh, Joseph, can you help us understand how uh, caste relates to the question of nationalism? Um, and how caste inequalities uh, become reinforced and strengthened under nationalist regimes. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Daniel. Um, as we know, uh, caste is perhaps uh, one of the oldest uh, yet surviving and thriving social structure uh, in India that relegates one fourth of its uh, uh, population uh, to be excluded from uh, uh, the mainstream life of the uh, country. Uh, so so uh, and one of the unfortunate uh, uh, features of this caste system is that it is, you know, a graded hierarchy wherein uh, some are considered to be untouchables while the rest are considered to be the twice born. 
so it is in this uh, uh, context, perhaps, we need to understand India and also understand uh, Indian, the rise of Indian nationalism. Uh, as I see uh, uh, the Indian nationalism, there are three uh, roots to it. Uh, one is its religious roots, wherein uh, the idea of India, which was not there before uh, the, uh, the coming of the British, uh, began to evolve itself more as a counter identity to the presence of the empire and also to the presence of the Muslim communities. So its roots lie in a religious identity. And secondly, perhaps the influence of Orientalism on the dominant caste communities uh, in, in India who form themselves as liberals yet gave leadership to the, the nationalist movement in this country. And the, the, the Orientalist whites and the dominant Brahminic forces in the country found something that is common to them in terms of their identity as belonging to the you know, Indo-Aryan communities that came from Europe. I think one needs to look at the Indian nationalism as having its root to it. And the third one perhaps is as a consequence of the presence of the empire and the initiative of the census that the empire you know, took for their own taxation system, uh, India found itself in a new context wherein while the caste identity was local and played out within the village body politic, with the presence of the empire and the census exercise that the empire took, the caste configurations began to become national uh, in, their, uh, uh, in their solidarity building and also in their political imagination. So India's nationalism certainly would not have worked and found its logical and whatever we see them today without the caste as being uh, one of its foundational characters. So in its origin and development, caste played its own role. And today, as we see the caste finding its own, the nationalism finding its own expression, uh, it often uses caste identities to play itself out. On the one hand, the dominant exclude the Sudra communities and the Dalit communities as being not part of the mainstream oh, body politic, while at the same time, they use the Sodra communities and Dalit communities as their foot soldiers to, to, to fulfill the agenda of the religious nationalists. I think that is the kind of context where, where we are in place, wherein the religious nationalism uses caste to propagate itself and also use caste configuration to achieve its own ends. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um... I'm uh, going to go back to the question of um, economics um, and uh, turn to Simone uh, for her um, wisdom. Uh, Simone, um, uh, you have uh, in some way given us a snapshot of how um, the COVID-19 crisis has particularly affected um, uh, uh, poor people and, and uh, black people. Um, uh, I want to, I want to want you to help us to think about um, how churches can respond to this economic implications of racism, uh, authoritarianism, and nationalism in your own context. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank for the question. So here in Brazil, we think the church have to. Um, to incentivize the education of people. Here in Brazil, the, the state are uh, uh, riding among the religion. It is uh, bad to us. We think the church have to think about your position in the society. 
is not to do laws, is not to do uh, politics to our own. But we have to, to, to think about a society, what uh, we have uh, equal sociality, we have respect to the other religions. Here in Brazil, is not happening. It. Here in Brazil, you have a lot of churches that use the police to uh, our, uh, your own own. So, uh, we here in Brazil, the progressive churches, the progressive Christian people uh, are fighting to Estado laico. Here we uh, call about Estado laico, a state who uh, see the people in your uh, rights, in your uh, lives, in your um, how can I say? How can can I say? Uh, the churches. We have church not seen to the poverty, just uh, just pick the money of the people, just um, just use the politics a wrong way. We ha we have a president who is using the Bible, who is using the name of God to justify a genocide of black people here, to justify the lack of righteous human rights here. You have to, to construct a church who the, the majority of actions is about human rights. Here in Brazil, you have to discuss human rights with the Christian people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simone. Um, what I'm going to do in a minute is to ask the panelists to engage in some uh, horizontal conversation to see whether there are resonances in, uh, in, uh, between your own experiences and the experiences of your co-panelists. But before I actually do that, um, I want um, our, um, uh, all of us, uh, if you feel so inspired, to um, Type any questions that you might have in the chat using the chat function uh, for our panelists uh, to take on. So, but now let me uh, turn to the panelists and then say, what is it um, that you think uh, connects you to the experiences of any of the other panelists um, who are with you today? Uh, please go, um, Shania. Yes, uh, listening to both Simone and Tandy, um, I, it was very striking about how similar our experiences of Black people are um, and of various forms of the diaspora around the world and um, how systemic racism um, against Black bodies is something that seems to be prevalent no matter where we are and um, how much it is ingrained into um, government and education and all systems of law enforcement and in ways in which it is consistently perpetually up to us as marginalized people to stand in, in, in resistance and opposition to the ways in which we are oppressed by dominant culture. Thank you very much, um, Tania, for that. Um, is there somebody else um, who would want to engage uh, with the experiences of your co-panelists? Joseph? Good. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, now, now we can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, though we do have our diverse experiences, uh, our diverse memories uh, of oppression, um, I think what brings us together perhaps is uh, our, our experience of suffering. Uh, that can uh, form a ground uh, for, for us to come together in solidarity. And I think uh, all these issues, though, have their own local presence, are in some way or other connected to the whole idea of empire. And therefore, dismantling empire would involve coming together of all these contexts. And you know, while working uh, in our own context, we also 
you know, express our solidarity with each other and work together. Thank you. Um, what about the uh, what about Tandi or Simoni? Do you want to come in or do you want to hold back for some time? Yeah, so, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I like to, to talk about a question that I read in the church. It's uh, what, what, what white people can do about the racism. It is very important to us to discuss it because the white people is affected by structural, structural uh, racism. Why? Because if I am have a problems to my life because the racism, the white people have benefits, have privileges about the racism. The white people have to think about the difference between white people and black people, uh, Europe people, American people, uh, Asian people, African people are different. We have to ask to us, why? Why? Because it's good the difference to white people, to European people. We have to then uh, renunciate the difference. Jesus do that. Jesus was a judge, uh, was a Rabino here in Brazil, we, we say Rabino. Jesus wa uh, was a Rabino and chose the poor people. White people are choose the black people. European people are choose for African people. Uh, Brazilian people, American people. So I think the uh, the main problem we are discuss is difference between people. You what you have people in dull society and people in high society. The problem is not only the black the black people. Uh, what we have is only black people discuss racism. You have white people discuss racism. You have the high society, Europeans, white people discuss what can I do to stop the racism. I think to uh, recognize the privileges, recognize the difference, and chose for the poverty people. Jesus Thank chose you. the poverty people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. I'm, go I'm going to uh, turn to Tandi, and then we are going to look at some of the questions that we have in our chat uh, uh, box. So, uh, Tandi, do you want to um, share your thoughts? Um, actually, I was quite interested in some of the questions that have been uh, sent in, um, because uh, I don't want to repeat what the others have said. I think, um, uh, especially with uh, Shania and Simone, I, I see a lot of um, similarities. Um, of course, each has a, its own contextual uniqueness, but uh, there are a lot of overlaps. And also, as Joseph has shared, you know, it's, it's a, one of the solutions is uh, solidarity, because I think each one of us, <laughs> we, we come from a tradition where there has been resilience, you know, in the face of, uh, of oppression. And so solidarity helps, I think, to, to empower. So yeah, I just wanted to repeat back what, uh, what my colleagues have said. Yes, uh, on that note, uh, let us turn to some of the questions that we find in the chat box, um, because these questions in some way uh, help us to make the shift between being just uh, spectators uh, to spec actors, as the um, um, uh, uh, Brazilian theater practitioner Augusto Ball said. How, how, how do we become part spec actors and become part of God's uh, story of transformation? I want to start off with a question from Peter Crushley. Um, his question is, um, how does the panel think white church spaces especially can change and become anti-racist uh, places. So um, is, there, is there anyone who wants to um, take on this question? I, 
I will if none of my colleagues would like to. <laughs> please do, please do. Um, sure, I think that the first step um, is, is like um, our uh, Alcoholics Anonymous program here says, is the first step is admitting there's a problem. And so I think that that is necessary. Um, and I think that also plays into the last question in the chat too, and realizing that um, the church and white churches have a hand and a history in the oppression of uh, black and brown bodies. And that, that that is as systemic and as connected to the story of the growth of Christianity around the world, and especially in white churches as anything else. And so admitting that that is true is key to the liberation and of um, oppressed people. And so uh, furthermore, I think that white churches having um, internal dialogues about how they are complicit and complacent in white supremacy culture and how we um, and how you can educate yourselves by reading various authors um, and, 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 and not putting that work on black people to educate you about racism and doing the work of educating yourselves and having those difficult conversations um, around dinner tables and, and private meetings and country clubs and all those things um, about how you can be effective tools in liberation because understand that is the work of true Christianity to liberate folks so that we might have all have life and life more abundantly, not just a selective few who look like a certain demographic. And I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, thank you, Shania. Um, uh, let me ask the other, other participants, the other panelists to uh, address the other questions that have come from the um, uh, panelists. Uh, the, the one question that has come is where should we put our attention in addressing questions of racism, um, authoritarianism and nationalism? Does someone want to take that up very briefly? We could also probably combine it with the question, how can the church be truly church in a time such as this? Joseph, did you want to respond to that question? I see that your microphone is turned off, turned on. I think I can, I, I can speak from uh, Indian context. Uh, looking at the way our theology evolved in India, uh, we know that uh, it is with the backdrop of uh, nationalism, uh, that the Indian Christian theology uh, uh, arose and evolved over time. And uh, what do what we have as Indian Christian theology, most of it is, you know, works with these nationalist sensibilities. Uh, I think uh, the challenge that we have before the church is to evolve with uh, a theology that will problematize the way in which we experience nationalism in our own country today. And I think, and remind ourselves uh, the way uh, Tillich addressed his own context, suggesting that nationalism, when it is raised to the level of ultimate concern, it becomes demonic. Uh, I think Indian Christian theology had participated in that demon for some time, and I think we need to denationalize ourselves. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, there is also this other qu question about um, whether um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement in the USA invokes the civil rights movement as an organization of agitation in the past against the empire in the USA. And this is something that has emerged out of reflections from the South African experience of people not invoking the names of Tutu uh, or Mandela, uh, but instead the names of Biko and uh, Franz uh, Fanon. Uh, do, do, do you want to take that question, Tandi? Uh, or... um, maybe I'll defer to my colleagues, but I wanted to respond to another one that came just before. Mm -hmm. It said, uh, could each panelist talk about how the Christian faith has contributed to the oppression and liberation of people? So I, I will, but doesn't mean the okay. others have to respond to that. Um, for me, I feel like one of the things that is important is to look at it on a global scale. Huh? Um, how, how has the Christian faith responded to, to people in general? And I, I think it's always important to remind ourselves that race as a concept was created about four, 500 years ago 
And, um, but Christianity <laughs> existed in parts of Africa, you know, long before, you know, slavery and colonization and also other parts of the world, you know, we know that St. Thomas was in India and so forth. So I think it's always important to look at the now, but also to look at our, the heritage outside of European empire before 500 years ago in order to address um, um, this race question. But if we look into the now, we also look at the, we have to look at the global scale and look at you know, places like South Africa, how people like uh, Busak were able to, from their Christian faith, resist apartheid. And um, so, yeah, I, I think maybe one of the most damaging things is that, um, uh, you know, especially from the context I, context I come from in Malawi in Africa, missions were attached to colonization and missions were attached to slavery, you know, through Portuguese and so on. And, and it's, it becomes very difficult to, to separate uh, the Christian faith <laughs> from, you know, uh, these oppressions. But um, yeah, looking beyond, I think is always helpful. Um, it doesn't answer everything, but it brings into the conversation that Christianity is not European. You know, there were African Christians and there were Asian Christians a long time ago, and they continue to be uh, today. Uh, so that's my contribution for that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think, friends, it is time for us to bring this panel to a close. Um, we have just scratched the surface. I'm, um, I'm aware of that. And as Chris has uh, mentioned, at the very beginning of this meeting, it's never going to be enough for us um, to address issues such as this in one hour. Uh, but I think um, uh, what, what we have um, found through our conversations today is um, uh, our strength and sustenance for the road ahead. And it was Alice Walker who said that, activism is my rent for living on the planet. So how are we going to take our conversations here uh, into opportunities for collaboration and also opportunities for liberation. And how do we do this as um, a part of our, of our rent uh, for living on uh, God's um, planet together? Uh, with these words, I uh, turn back to Philip, um, who will uh, help us to make the transition to the breakout rooms. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Peniel. Thank you very much, Shania. Joseph, Tande, uh, you have all done so, so well. Simone, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, before we bring this entire session to a close with a closing prayer, may I invite my colleague Hans to give us a few announcements about the discernment process. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Um, I was fascinating, uh, fascinated by the um, panel discussion and also by the chat because uh, we realize we are in the middle of discernment, we are understanding, we are um, uh, judging, we are uh, uh, confessing, and we are already planning uh, ideas that we should take up as the communion. I think this is what this process is all about. And the next step in the conversation is to formalize um, these uh, processes by really bringing all the ideas together into a document that we then can discuss as a proposal as uh, the WCRC's message. So the next of our sessions at March 10th will not be again a sharing session, but a harvesting session where we will bring the stuff together that we have heard and shared during the last uh, three months. And um, there is a drafting team which will get a document together where we will try to harvest the most important learnings and try to work out the language which is emerging where we express our analysis, but also where we ad uh, address uh, our confession and our witness. And uh, this will be an obje object of discussion. So I invite uh, all of you to our next session on March 10th to write this conversation. Thank you. May we please have the closing worship PowerPoint come up. Before we 
begin, I'd like all of you to take a moment to look at the image that is on the right of the PowerPoint. In the year 2007, and again in 2008, there were terrible riots against Christian communities in an Eastern state in the country of India. Among other things that happened, a Catholic sister called Mina Barua was gang raped. A few of us visited as a fact-finding team immediately after this incident. The Catholic Resource Center in which this incident happened was burnt, suit lined the walls, and they had kept it as it was, as a testimony to what had happened before. But in that place, on a poster which was on the wall, somebody had outlined in the suit these words in a heart, saying, Jesus is alive. And so as we now pray together, May I ask that our collective response to these biddings as an affirmation of our faith be Jesus is alive. In the midst of violence, of pain, and in the face of death, we affirm Jesus is alive. In the midst of torture, gang rape and burning, we affirm Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Our recognition that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And so death can conquer us. Systems of death do not daunt us for life. Jesus, Jesus is alive. Is alive. Jesus I know that we will not be beaten down. And though we are pressed, we are not crushed. That though we face repression, we will not be broken. We believe in the resurrection because Jesus, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. <laughs> I believe that God's reign on earth will come. That there will be justice for all the oppressed because... Jesus, Jesus is, alive. is alive. And now let us pray together. May it come soon to the hungry, to the weeping, to those who have thirsted for your justice, for those who have waited centuries for a truly human life. Grant us the patience to smooth the way on which your kingdom comes to us. Grant us hope that we may not be weary in proclaiming and working for it, despite so many conflicts, threats, and Grant us a clear vision that in this hour of our history, we may see the horizon and know the way on which your kingdom comes to us. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. To Amen. 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 Jesus is alive. Done, Philip. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in today's session. We are growing together. We are finding our way. We will reach our destination. We will defeat the monster. The empire cannot reign forever. Jesus Christ.